Welcome to TensorFlow Meets. I'm Pete Warden, and today we're going to be talking to Marius Eriksson. So I understand you're using TensorFlow to help your daughter, who's a type 1 diabetic. Uh, maybe you could tell us a bit more about that. Sure, yeah. So uh, it helps have a little bit of background in, in uh, what sort of treating type 1 diabetes uh, entails. So uh, uh, when you're a type 1 diabetic, your pancreas is basically non-functioning and not secreting insulin into your bloodstream, uh, which is required for your cells to take up glucose. Because of this phenomenon, we basically have to be able to predict what glucose levels should be. Uh, and then based on that prediction, uh, deliver sort of a correct amount of insulin or withhold insulin uh, if uh, we predict that blood glucose is going to go low, right? Uh, and so uh, because of those, uh, those reasons, we, uh, the approach that I've taken uh, is to employ machine learning uh, actually in two ways. So one is a model that uh, uses uh, data that's gathered on a continual basis every five minutes uh, and predicts future blood glucose based on you know, that past. And then secondly, uh, uh, a different model, or, or rather a model that builds on the first model, tries to figure out what is an optimal insulin delivery schedule uh, that will uh, effectively uh, you know, uh, keep uh, blood sugar within this sort of Goldilocks zone, right? And so that second model knows about the sort of pharmacodynamics of insulin uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, actually, I use TensorFlow for both of those. Right. One of the really nice things about TensorFlow is that it's very easy to compose these models together, and that's exactly what, uh, how this works. Awesome. Do you want to, uh, it looks like sure. you actually have a pump there. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the pump, or a, a pump similar to what my daughter wears, um, and this is just something you keep in your pocket or whatever, um, and there's a, you see this little tubing that comes out of it. There's an insulin reservoir uh, in here. Uh, the tubing connects to you know, effectively a small needle that, that's inserted into uh, some fatty area of your body. This pump in particular uh, can be controlled remotely. Uh, and so the first thing that I had to do for this project, uh, which is not machine learning uh, sort of related, uh, is to uh, effectively reverse, reverse engineer that radio protocol so that I can control it from uh, a Raspberry Pi, which is the, the second component. And so um, this is a Raspberry Pi Zero, as we can see. And this is sort of where all the magic happens. Uh, and so the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero through a custom ISM radio with custom firmware that knows how to communicate to uh, the insulin pump, uh, can effectively instruct the insulin pump what to do, deliver this much insulin or withhold insulin or whatever. The uh, Raspberry Pi also uses uh, BLE to uh, communicate with the phone, and that serves two purposes. One is to receive uh, uh, blood glucose values from this uh, continuous glucose monitoring system that integrates with the phone. Uh, and the second is to receive um, instructions from the phone uh, as to, for example, when my daughter eats. And so whenever she eats, we have to enter, oh, you're you know, we're eating this many grams of carbs, uh, so the model can take that into account, right? And without that, it wouldn't be able to predict the future very well. So um, what does your daughter think of this? Is this making a difference for her? Or? Oh, absolutely. And so, so uh, there's, there's two big ways in which it makes a difference, I think. So one is um, it just reduces the labor intensity uh, of, of diabetes. Uh, you know, you still have to intervene on occasion. Uh, there's still a lot of things to do, uh, but uh, you can't beat a computer in terms of uh, you know, uh, being able to do the same thing every five minutes over and over and over again, right? And so literally every five minutes, the system adjusts insulin delivery based on the you know, predicted, uh, what it predicts of the future. The second uh, big thing is that um, typically uh, the way uh, diabetes is treated uh, is with something called basal and bolus therapy. And what that means is that it's a, it's a um, you know, still fairly complex, but far simplified version of what the model does. Uh, and uh, you have to sort of, even with this therapy, you have to, uh, every time you eat, uh, you know, check what your blood glucose is, uh, compute, you know, using a few ratios, how much insulin to deliver, uh, and, and then do it, and then check your blood sugar, you know, again a little bit later. But again, with, with using machine learning techniques and, and, and other things, uh, we can do far, far better. Uh, we can understand uh, much more deeply the, uh, the evolution of insulin in the blood. Uh, we can predict the evolution of carbohydrate appearance in the blood and so on and so forth. And the way this model works is that it, uh, you know, it's obviously trained with a lot of historical data. And so uh, individual variants right, is also something that the model can pick up very readily. Right? So as, a, as an example, uh, it's known that individuals respond slightly differently to, to insulin, right? 
maybe the uh, pharmacodynamics uh, evolve in slightly different ways. Maybe they, uh, maybe it takes longer for the insulin to clear, right? Um, maybe the peak is stronger, things like that. Uh, with this model, um, it actually learns what the pharmacodynamics are. So you mentioned data as well. How did you actually go about getting the training data that you needed to train and test these models? Right. So after I reverse engineered the, the uh, RF protocol of the pump, uh, I started uh, basically first just observing. And so every five minutes, it uh, effectively queries the pump and asks how much have it delivered in the last five minutes, right? But still doing manual therapy, right? So we were still uh, administering insulin um, through the remote control, but we were controlling it, right? Uh, and then at the same time entering, every time my daughter had a meal, we would enter our estimate of the number of carbs in that meal and our estimate of the glycemic index. So those things together with capturing the uh, glucose readings from the continuous glucose monitors uh, effectively gives us all the raw data, right? So we can, we can observe blood glucose levels, observe the insulin that, that's been delivered, uh, and uh, all the food that she, uh, that she ate. And so that's, that's basically how we uh, gathered the raw data. We did that for uh, you know, a few months uh, before we started uh, you know, with the, the exercise of, of modeling. And at this point, uh, my daughter's values are almost normal glycemic, meaning that uh, from that point of view, uh, it's almost as if she doesn't have uh, diabetes. And so uh, that's another huge benefit of, of this kind of automation. And again, this is possible to achieve, you know, if you're willing to, you know, look at your blood sugar every five minutes and do a bunch of complicated <laughs> math. Right? Uh, asking a five-year-old girl to, uh, yes. <laughs> to deal with that when she's more interested in Correct. running around and playing is... Doesn't work, yeah. So um, maybe you can tell me a bit about how you uh, found, uh, you know, how you decided on TensorFlow and how you uh, used it on sure. the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. So the reason I decided on, on TensorFlow is initially because it was very easy to sort of switch from experimentation to production, right? And so I would do all the kind of modeling work and experimentation and, you know, just Jupyter notebooks and all this stuff is very, very convenient. Um, and um, the uh, controller code, uh, it's actually written in Go, right? So all the stuff that deals with the radio transmission and the time series databases and all that stuff is all written in Go. And so with TensorFlow, I was able to take the model that I developed in this Jupyter notebook, um, save it to you know protocol buffers basically, and then you know load it up in Go. Uh, and uh, that provides a really nice and clean interface. I almost never have to change the, the sort of Go code that loads the model. It knows how to feed it the right data and everything, but I can change completely the behavior of the model just you know, sort of purely in this high-level way using Python, right? So that was one really big appealing um, uh, thing for TensorFlow. The other thing, obviously, is that it can run in embedded systems, right? And so uh, you know, the Raspberry Pi is an ARM-based system, and uh, I can run the the inference and the retraining, uh, you know, without having to worry about the underlying architecture or anything like that. Uh, uh, the third thing uh, I think is I'm uh, very much using uh, the sort of composability of uh, the TensorFlow computa computation graphs. Um, so uh, as an example, it was very easy to take the model that predicts uh, blood glucose and compose it with a model that uh, is going to recommend an insulin delivery schedule, right? And because of the way the computation graph works uh, and, and the automatic differentiation and everything, um, you know, uh, it's, it's very, very easy to you know, b build that second model and just let an optimizer have a go at it and you get the right results, right? Uh, without ha me having to sit down and do any calculus or anything like that, which is uh, very, very appealing to me. So I, I would say those are kind of the main reasons uh, why I picked TensorFlow. Yeah, and um, for the listeners, we do actually now have a um, version of TensorFlow that is built already for the Raspberry Pi uh, that we run as part of our nightly builds. Um, so I'm hoping as you look at upgrading TensorFlow in the future, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we may be able to help you uh, get up and running using some pre-built uh, binaries so that you don't have to build everything from scratch. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's awesome that you're actually able to uh, you know, pull it all together and get it uh, up and running. That's right, yeah. I, I, I think it speaks to TensorFlow that uh, that was perhaps the most difficult part of this. <laughs> 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 And is the, is the code available um, for what you've actually built? Yeah, so, so some of it is. Uh, so for, for, for different reasons, uh, you know, obviously this is a, a system that uh, carries some risk and you know, could be construed as a medical device and things like that. Uh, the, the model that I use in, in production, I have not um, actually released publicly. 
but kind of most of the code around it I have, right, including the uh, radio stack for you know, all that stuff. However, I have uh, uh, made a notebook that kind of replicates the, the general setup also in TensorFlow, uh, though using a much simpler model. But it replicates precisely what the setup is. So you have a model that predicts blood glucose, and then a second model that composes the first in order to uh, optimize the delivery schedule. And so that's all open source. It's a Jupyter notebook that I published that's basically sort of show and demonstrate how, uh, how this can be done in this, in this manner. So obviously, this is a very safety critical system. And it poses a lot of uh, questions and problems that you wouldn't have in other machine learning systems. Can you tell us a little bit about how you thought and planned and tackled that? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so there's a few few different aspects of that. So one is, you know, obviously a uh, a model could learn the wrong thing and, and do something dangerous. And so, um, you know, in order to kind of prevent that, there's all sorts of sort of secondary um, safety measures in place that uh, you know simpler models that perform safety checks effectively and will, will sort of shut off uh, the, the, the main model if, it, uh, if it's doing the wrong thing, right? Um, so that's sort of one aspect of it. The other thing is that from a uh, sort of systems perspective, um, it, it's designed to uh, limit the, uh, you know, the, the amount of action that, that the model can do. So, so uh, as an example, if, her blood, you know, if, if your blood glucose is very, very high, uh, and the model wants to correct it down to the range that it um, uh, that is desired, so the set point. Uh, what it does is instead of correcting down to that range, it corrects down to some maximum uh, level beneath what it is to, at the moment. And so it's required to basically gradually correct down so that uh, in case sensitivity changes very rapidly, you don't end up over delivering. And so you're effectively kind of throttling the action uh, of, of the system. And so there are a few mechanisms like that. Um, and then uh, from a sort of systems point of view, anytime you have you know, data loss or uh, you know, even if the software crashes, for example, uh, it's designed so that it uh, fails in a safe way. So you know, shuts off insulin or, or, or um, delivers only a, small, a very small amount. OK, well, thanks so much, everyone, uh, for joining us on TensorFlow Meets. And thank you, Marius. And if you want to see more like this, please hit that subscribe button. See ya.